Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host and the producer of the chats, and the fireside chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I'm interviewing Panda Pup in Boots, who is Alaska State Bootblack 2017. Hi, Panda, how are you? Hey, how are you? How's Anchorage these days? It's finally warming up, but that, of course, makes everything an ice skating rink. Warming up? It's December 30th. It, well, we had our, our longest night. We had solstice, so now we're having more sun, and the weather is starting to kind of warm up. So, like, yesterday it was in the 40s, so all the snow started to melt. Then it got below freezing at night, so now we have an ice skating rink. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> out driving. Oh, yeah. I've already fallen dislocated a shoulder and wrist this month, so... Mm. Let, let's start right at the beginning with uh, a little bit about you. Where are you from? Where are you from? Tell us a little bit about your family. Um, so I'm originally from, I was born in Texas, but my family moved a lot. So I don't have really a home base from childhood. We were in Alaska. We were in Hawaii. We were in California, Georgia, Florida, Virginia, everywhere. So I'm kind of a mutt. I've don't have really a place that I can identify as home until I moved here to Alaska. And this is home. <laughs> what took your family all over? Um, I don't know. My parents just moved a lot. <laughs> and I just kind of followed. <laughs> okay. So why Alaska? I was following a guy who I'm no longer with. <laughs> but I'm a very spur of the moment adventurous type. And... My life at the time was not very good where I was. I was in Georgia and it wasn't good. And I met a guy. He lived in Alaska. I was like, okay, I'll move to Alaska. My that gosh. Eight That's years ago. Step. Yeah, it was a big step. My parents thought I was insane, but it's been the best thing ever for me. Had my best life up here. No longer with that particular person, but <laughs> Alaska has, was the best choice I ever made. Why has it been your best life? Um. I finally found who I was personally in my own self. Um, and I have a very supportive network of people up here that I've met, like my husband, who I just got married to on July 31st, wow. and uh, my best friend and other people. And so I have a really strong support network up here. And career wise, I'm still figuring it out, but <laughs> I've had some really good jobs and I have really good relationships with ex bosses. So. Just figuring things out. Tell us a little bit about your community in Alaska. I understand it's it's a very uh, sort of a smaller group. It is. It is an extremely smaller group, and it's partly because of the way Alaska is laid out. We have lots of little tiny towns, um, and but everything is so spread out because the state is so huge. Like we have a fair decent number of people in the state of Alaska, and a fair decent number of kinky people in Alaska. But we're all just so spread out that there becomes these little tiny, small groupings of people. Um, and then, of course, within each grouping, there's subgroupings. And Anchorage has a fairly decent sized community. Um, we have lots of really good community leaders who have munches. And so everyone can find where they personally fit. Everyone has their place. Tell me more about your community. What sorts of things go on? Um, so we have uh, the, the biggest part group in our community would be the people that run the, um, the yearly convention that we have for um, kink education, which, of course, we haven't had the last year because of COVID. But um, they run a, every year we have a convention, which is when the title competition is. And then we have little mini conventions where they'll bring up a presenter from out of state. Usually um, we've had. I think 150 out-of-state presenters come up over the last, um, I think they've been doing it for nine years, maybe 10, not positive on that. Um, and the conventions are great. Everybody comes from all the other little communities and all the communities kind of come together for that convention and for the little mini conventions. Um, and then we have our rope group. We have a whole bunch of people who are really into rope. And so they have their own little thing and they're really, really, Cool, and they have some really good education groups, um, meetings that they do. And our community is very much 
we help each other. We're always looking out for each other and having each other's back. Um, we'll have like, if there's a community member who's sick, we'll all gather together to go and like clean that person's house for them before they come home from the hospital. Um, we support our older um, community members. We have one community member, she's in her eighties, I believe. And she got really sick during the period of COVID when nobody could like see each other. And we all came together, cleaned her entire apartment while she was in the hospital, took care of her cats and just made sure she was all set up with everything she needed. Um, she's like the auntie of everybody. <laughs> she's everybody's Aww. wicked auntie. She's the sweetest thing. So we always are looking out for each other. You mentioned a big convention. What, what's the name of it? Um, it's called Northern Exposure. Um, and the little mini conventions that spur off of it are Northern Exposure Lights. <laughs> and it's a week, weekend long convention, but it actually runs kind of a week if you include all the extra stuff. Um, but it usually runs a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We have two play parties, um, two night play parties, and then we have three days of classes. And we, our community houses all the presenters. We don't stick them in hotels. We don't just have them off doing their own thing. We house them with community members. And then the community members are who drive them wherever they need to go. So we have a chance, it makes it so that the people who come up get to meet our community and our community gets to meet all these people on a more personal level than just they're standing in front of us teaching a class. Oh. And we feed everybody. Um, everything's included when you, and it's probably one of the cheaper conventions, not counting, of course, flying up here, but we pay for them to fly up here. We oh. pay for everything. <laughs> and we take them to little community things around. Like we take them to um, the wildlife refuge and we take them hunting and we take them fishing. Oh and gosh. at the end of the weekend, the Monday after we have a survivor's brunch and then everyone goes out and has this huge barbecue out at the presenter who um, hosts the whole thing, her house and have a big old barbecue out there and everybody has fun and hangs out. And it's a really neat experience. And we meet them at the, airport with big old signs saying <laughs> that they're in Alaska and they're here for us. And yeah, we, we make a big show of it. It's a lot of fun. When do you host this? It's usually around pride. So usually in around July, June, July, depending on when pride falls. Okay. Um, so it's, it's really cool. Cause uh, it also happens to be, I believe our producers um, birthday that time period too. So it's kind of her big birthday celebration at the same time. <laughs> what are some of the, uh, main classes that you'll generally teach at something like that? Well, so our community gets to pick the classes. So uh, the producer will go around to all the different um, socials and munches and she'll have a binder of all these presenters who have either expressed interest or who she's recruited who would be interested in presenting and a list of their classes. And the community gets to kind of pick what we would like to have. Oh. Um, so it's really, we really get a lot of input into what's coming to our state. And so we've had a whole conventions that were based around um, MS relationships. We've had it where it's been heavily tilted towards boot blacking. And usually it tends to be where the conventions are really varied, but there'll be like a heavy influence of a particular thing because that's what people are into in that period. We try to have some, you know, one-on-one level classes mixed in there, some higher level classes mixed in, um, lots of unusual stuff. We've had people come up who, uh, did consent, non-consent classes. We've had ones who came up and were like, we're going to teach you how to have an MS household that's in the real world. Like who people who were the subs may be an executive at a boss. How do you navigate that? And we've had some really amazing presenters come up. And we also highlight some local people too during the convention, at least one local person as well. Is this when you do the Mr. Alaska leather contest? I thought wasn't one of them in January. So that would be um, uh, Arctic Heat, and that is done actually by the Last Frontier Men's Club. There, those titles are completely separate from us, but we are all friendly community. Um, the Last Frontier Men's Club is a uh, gay men's club, and so they put on the Mr. Alaska Leather, Miss Alaska Leather, uh, Mr. Bear, and Mr. Bear Cup. Oh. They host those tonight. Our convention only hosts the boot black title. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. But we work together. Like we we show up at their events and our boot blacks are there and we're there. And usually a lot of me our members are competing and we all are very integrated, but it's their own. They've been doing their title a lot longer than the boot black title. Uh, 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 okay. 
Now, boot blacking. <laughs> I want to know, take me way back to when you first even had an idea, not only about boot blacking, but about anything in the, sort of the kink leather scene. So my start in the kink community was way, way back when I was in my, I'd say early 20s, maybe 21, um, via virtual online at the time, because I was living in LA and had not figured out that there was actually an in-person community for this. And I was part of the Gorian community at that time. Um, for the <laughs> I said, audience, please from that. explain that. Huh? For the audience, please explain the Gorian community. Um, so the Gorian community is based off a series of books written by John Norman, and they are a, a sci-fi um, alternate Earth where um, these alien bugs decided that women were to be subservient to men, and they also removed all weapons, so other than like, you know, medieval weapons. You had no guns or anything like that. Only the bug aliens had the weapons, but there became a sort of a cult cult subculture of people who actually tried to live that type of lifestyle. And it's very much like an MS lifestyle, but it's much more strict and um, protocol based, very, very protocol based. But I have since evolved out of that <laughs> and moved on to different things, but that's where I started. And I didn't really discover boot black until much, much later, but I'd always had a love for leather and for um, shining shoes. Cause my, Grandfather and my father were both military. So I learned, and my first husband was military. So shining shoes was a thing. <laughs> Let's take a step back though. I want to know more about the Gorian community. What did that teach you? What sorts of things did you learn? So I, I learned a lot about how to be of service and how to be quiet in service, um, doing the things before the things were needed. Um, kind of, if anyone knows the show MASH, and remembers radar from MASH. He always heard the hel knew the helicopter was coming before anyone else did. And they they really impress on that same sort of um, behavior from their subs um, in the Gorian lifestyle. Do it before it's needed. Um, there's a lot of similarities to like um, service cultures of the English in the fact of how you serve drinks, um, how you serve if there's a whole group of people where you're not noticed. You're not to, supposed to be noticed. Um, there was strong emphasis on learning how to walk where you wouldn't make bells jingle. <laughs> wow. A lot of the slaves wore bells on their ankles and on their bodies, and you would have to learn how to walk without making those make noise. And that was how they, one of the ways they taught you how to be a silent servant. At least in wow. the community I was in. Every group is different, but that was a group I was in. <laughs> were you successful in doing that? Oh, yes. I was very successful. I was in it for several years. Um, and I ended up at one point becoming a trainer doing it. Um, the community I was in had a Gorian council. I got actually freed by my owner that I had at the time and was made a free woman, which is a whole thing in of itself. And um, was part of that particular community's Gorian council. Um, that community, I don't think around anymore. I think it's uh -huh. kind of dispersed but that was a long time ago a lot of things have changed and um but I loved it and I like know way too much about like actual facts from the books and well wow. I've read every book and I do love it I still love it and I still find a lot of it plays into my current life because I have a very strict belief on how subs should act in certain environments and I try to, you know, still carry through a lot of the same stuff I learned because I loved it and I found it graceful. Oh. It, it was it was an amazing part of my life. And my current um, partner, husband, is not Gorian, um, but he does have very kind of 1950s old old school type of way of running things. He's in charge. You do what he wants. He wants things a certain way. You fold the clothes a certain way, <laughs> you know, and so the Gorian training has helped with that because it enables me to, okay, I learn how he wants it done. And then that's how it's done. But we don't have an MS. We are um, DS, not MS. So we don't have it constant. It's more organic. 
Mm-hmm. I still have free will. <laughs> Interestingly, you're the first person who's ever mentioned that to me. I've never previously heard of it. Oh, really? Is it is it very popular? Or do many people use it? So Gore gets a lot of um, backlash and heat. Um, there's Gore tends to we we have found Gore tends to attract some of the less positive elements in uh, in the communities. Um, because there's that very strong, you do not have a voice if you're a slave in the Gorian community. You do as you're told, period. Um, so it it can have a little bit higher propensity for predators. Oh. Um, and plus, a lot of people are like, you're following the belief system of a set of fictional books. <laughs> you know, and so there's a little bit of, kind of people are like, yeah, the Gorians are over there, you know. So it doesn't get as much view as some of the others. Interesting. And I have found some pretty toxic people in the Goring community when I've tried to like return to it to at least just like socialize with people that know the same things I do. I have found a lot of toxicity and um, lots of uh, male chauvinism. <laughs> How does the community manage those elements? I'm not sure. I haven't been a part of that community for a long time. Um, I don't know really of any local people who have subscribed to it. Um, so I don't know how anybody's handling it now. Back when I was in, we did have the Gorian Council. People, if they showed themselves to be predatory in our particular community, we did push them out. Um, we did notify people, hey, this person's not safe. But that was a long time ago, and I really can't speak to what's happening in it now. I just know it's not a hugely popular thing here. Uh, okay. But you mentioned boot blacking and taking care of your grandfather's and your father's boots and your, your ex-husband's shoes and boots. Where did that germinate for you? So I've always been that person who helps out in every aspect of my life. Even when I was a little child, I was members of orchestras and when they'd have like an auction or a dinner party, I was the one who's like, I'll volunteer, I'll volunteer. I'm the happy little volunteer that does all the things. Um, I'm a service beast I can't help it and you know my dad was busy my grandfather was busy my grandfather was getting older and his hands weren't as strong anymore and they would teach me and if it was something that someone important to me wanted or wanted a certain way it became sorry my cat um it became something that I really wanted to do for that person as a like to service and for me I'm really kind of geeky and nerdy and the um more challenging something was, the more I wanted to figure it out. So for me, it was making it the best it could be. From like, I would take the dirtiest, muckiest, nastiest boots from them working out in the yard or whatever, and I'd make them shine. And that, and their praise and their saying, "Oh wow, I didn't even think that boot could look like that again," became kind of like, "Okay, this is something cool." And so that just carried on. And then when I came up here to Alaska and became part of the Alaska King community, I met the person who was to become the first Alaska state boot black, um, Eric Joseph, who then became Mr. International boot black. Um, he fed that love for service and he fed that love for boots. And I'm kind of a shy, quiet person who stays in the corner and boot blacking was my way of, I could still stay in my little safe corner but I could still be a part of the group and I could still interact. And it then became a way for me to help other wallflowers like myself feel comfortable if it was their first time in the club or whatever. Cause I'd like see them sitting over in the corner, like I used to do. And I'd be like, Hey, let me look up, work on your shoes. And then that would kind of open people up and make them feel a little safer because that's that safe place to get introduced. And that for me just is something that, very dear to my heart and hearing people's stories when they sit in the stand and hearing people's histories. And that's boot blacking for me. But how did you learn the skills necessary to do that? Um, so I learned the military way of doing it, which is um, a little bit not as accepted way to do it anymore for some people. Um, when I was a kid with my grandfather, my dad, and then Eric Joseph taught me um, what he had learned. And then I, I then 
furthered by every time a boot black would come into town for a convention, I would sit at their feet and learn whatever their tricks and techniques were. And um, I went to boot black roundup up there in Chicago and uh, interned under Leslie Anderson for the time that I was up there for the roundup. And that was amazing. Learned all oh, kinds no. of cool tricks. I loved it. And um, how was went, it amazing? Oh, it was amazing because they uh, showed me how to work with old leather or leather that had been soaked in cigarette smoke and bar sweat and how to preserve that person's history while still preserving the leather. Because everything that we do to leather can damage it or age it or wear it out. Like, you know, all the pins we put on our vests, they put little holes and they do damage and then the metal and leather doesn't always get along. So they get this really gross gooey green stuff on them and that would eat at the leather and how to preserve the person's history of, you know, they were a smoker and they, you know, liked certain things and you don't want to remove that from their leather, but you still want to protect the leather from any damage from that stuff. And it was really fascinating to see um, Leslie's process of how to do that. And I learned some tricks to help make my leather last longer. And because of Leslie, I never put pins on my vest. I actually um, attached snaps so I have little flaps that I put my pins on so there's no pinholes. And that way I can also take it off when I'm scoring the vest so there's no weight dragging on the seams. Um, but yeah, I've picked up little tricks and things from different boot blacks over the years. Um, and it's pretty much been the main thing I focus on in the King community is boot blacking. Um, so I, I hunt out boot blacks and I ask them what their little tricks are and what little things they've figured out. Cause everyone figures out a different thing. And then there's also, you know, this person in Chicago has different technique because of the weather that they encounter and the rocks are over old salt that they deal with people in Alaska completely different way of doing things. People in Texas, completely different way of doing things, different products. And you learn that certain products work better in certain areas than others. And so you learn what you need when you, wherever you go. And it's really cool. Can you depict what that might be for somebody watching this video? What would be a difference between what you might do in Alaska versus in Chicago versus Texas or wherever else? So um, places like Chicago and Alaska that have snow and cold and ice, and then as a result have the lovely products we put out in the environment to combat, excuse me, combat snow, these things can damage your leather really badly. And, you know, so you have to learn how to remove that stuff. And they're not easy to remove. Rock salt is horrible. That stuff is so hard to remove. So you have to figure out what products work for that what work for your area. So we have really extreme colds here in Alaska. So most polishes are going to crack and break. Um, and so they'll not stick, stick to the boot well. And so you have to tend to use a lot, um, a lot harder polishes because they'll, they'll form a little bit better. Um, whereas in Chicago, I could use softer polishes because it's a little bit warmer there. Tech is way warmer. You want something that's very, very, easy to manipulate, but it's not going to melt away. Um, also with uh, Texas, you have sand and um, that uh, red clay dirt. And you have to use different products to combat that because something that would work in Alaska for cleaning off dirt and picking um, sand and stuff off is not going to work in Texas hmm. because clay, the clay in Texas is a lot thicker and gummier. Um, so you just have to figure out what works for the area you're in. And also you have to learn what the people wear there. So in Alaska, we wear a lot of hard duty leather because we deal with a lot of rough conditions. Whereas, you know, people who are in California who may mostly wear their leather, let's say for conventions, they're going to have the softer, more comfortable leathers. Can't use the same conditioners on that. Mm -hmm. It'll just weigh it down. And um, actually when I went to uh, San Diego for Imsbaba, they, um, I didn't even take hardly any polishes because most of the stuff I was dealing with down there was uh, um, oil tan words. <laughs> so I didn't have a need for a lot of polishes. I was able to do mostly everything with just conditioners. And I make my own conditioner and it's super lightweight. And it pretty much has been, I found been pretty universal wherever I go to be useful. How do you, how did you come across that? How do you make that? Um, so 
again, nerdy, geeky person. I wanted to know what was in these things that I'm putting on people's leathers. And also because I wanted to, I was worried about allergens and what might be alert people would be allergic to. Cause like for me, sapphire gives me a headache, sapphire polish, the smell of it. Um, so I just kind of contacted the makers of different conditioners and polishes and whatnot, asked what they put in it. Some of them told me, some of them didn't. Um, and then I sort of formulated my own and I was looking for things that were shelf stable, that are not going to rot, that are not going to go rancid and, but also would be beneficial to the leather, but not hurt the leather. And so I formulated my own. I did um, learn a bunch of stuff from uh, uh, the rebels because they were also producing their own soaps and conditioners around the same time as I was starting to formulate mine. And um, so I'm I did learn sorry, a lot from them. Who are the, ru the rebels? Uh, Mickey Rebel and um, I'm drawing a blank on the first name here. They've been at my house. <laughs> and I feel so bad, but they're the rebels. Um, they're from Portland. Uh, <laughs> name, right now I can't think of his name, but it, I know his wife's name was Mickey Rebel. Um, they came to our house. They stayed in our house during the conventions. <laughs> Pretty right. much every time they've come up, they've stayed at our house. <laughs> Um, but they're, they're an amazing couple. Um, one of our community members actually moved and lives with them. Um, but, uh, yeah, I learned a lot from them. They are amazing boot blacks. And, uh, I just, I figured out what worked for me and what I liked and, um, mine's coconut oil based and beeswax. And I fluctuate the mix when I make it, depending on the season. So if it's summertime, I'm going to use a little bit more beeswax. If it's wintertime, a little less beeswax mm -hmm. kind of thing. So you never know which mix you're getting, depending on the season. <laughs> but um, I am working on formulating my own polishes, too. But that's a long process to figure out the right dyes to use. That's very fascinating. I, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin trying to do some of that. What kind of research? Of you, well, what kind of research though are you able to do to learn like the chemistries of some of this? So a lot, so pretty much every company that produces a product has to have um, documentation on what chemicals they use in their products. They don't necessarily have to put them on the products if it's not a food product, um, which polishes and conditioners and soaps for leather are not food products. So they basically kind of put a general outline of what's on there, but they don't actually tell you what it is. But if you contact them, you can get the actual list of what they put in their product because they have to have that information readily available for people due to allergen issues and things like that. Um, and so you can get the list from them and then it's just, you know, experimentation, figuring out what ratios, because they're not going to tell you their exact recipe. They'll mm -hmm. tell you, okay, we have this items in it. We're not going to tell you exactly how we did it. Mm -hmm. um and so then you just you know sit in your kitchen and tinker <laughs> put a little bit of this put a little bit of that and see what happens <laughs> my gosh my gosh are there particular products that you prefer to use i know most oh, yeah. blacks are very particular oh yeah i i am pretty picky i i'm my preference products is angelus for polishes I will use Saffir a little bit if I'm like in a high speed situation. The Saffir does pop a shine a lot quicker than most products. It's also a higher quality product, but it still gives me a headache. So I don't use it that often. Um, and I use pretty much exclusively my own conditioner and my own soap, but I have no problems with any of the other soaps and conditioners out there. They're all good. Everyone has a good one. Um, but for me, it's mostly Angelus products. I have used Kiwi, have absolutely zero issues with Kiwi. Some boot blacks hate Kiwi, some love Kiwi. Um, but, you know, Kiwi is a perfectly fine product. You can get it anywhere. Anybody can walk into a Walmart and find Kiwi, you know, and so it's readily available. And, but it's a, it's not as good for Alaska, in my opinion, but um, it's a perfectly good product. But for me, Angelus works best up here. Why? Pretty, Why is the difference? It's ha it's just soft enough, but just hard enough to work with our weather, no matter which season we're in. Um, and I found that I can pretty much universally use it anywhere I go. I found that Lincoln was a little too hard for here. 
Um, and I haven't really tried pretty any other polishes per se, other than those that I can remember, other than like borrowing someone's at a convention that I, when I didn't have a color I needed. And Angels has a really good mix of colors. They have pretty much every color you can imagine available. Um, plus they also make the, the leather paints and the leather um, dyes. So it's, you can keep it homogenous across the board. I like to try to keep the same product on every stage of the process if I can. Um, so when you start mixing different products, you can sometimes have some fun little <laughs> results where things won't polish right or something will get tacky and then it'll collect every dust particle in the room. So if you can keep to the same product for every step of the game, you tend to have a little bit better results. I see. You mentioned that the contest, the Alaska State Boot Black contest, is held during your, I'm sorry, was it Northern Exposure? Yes. Uh, in the summertime. Tell us about your journey uh, down that road. So my journey started actually in uh, 2016. I ran for the first time in 2016. I did not win. Um, I was very sad. I went home and cried. But I came back. I convinced my partner that I had at the time that I wanted to try again. Um, and they were very reluctant because they had seen how brokenhearted I was the first time. But they said, OK, you can run again. And I ran and I won. I stayed of my life. And our convention is a really, really fun um, competition. We have um, our, we, our, our competition has evolved. When the first year that we had it, there really was only one contestant, which was Eric Joseph, and he was the starter. He was the granddaddy of the whole kind of, you know, thing. Um, second year, it was uh, me and two other community members, one from Fairbanks and um, another, the one who won. Uh, and then the third year, it was me and a gr another girl competing. The second year, it, we had out of state people come up to be the judges. So it wasn't a community judge event the second year. And um, based on the paperwork, because we were given our um, scoring cards at the end so that we could review them and figure out what we needed to adjust for if we wanted to run again. Most of the critiques for myself were I didn't seem to fit the part. Because um, the first year I ran, I was very femme. I wore dresses the whole time. I didn't have a whole lot of leather. I think I had one pair of leather boots and that was it. And they weren't even like quality leather boots. They were, you know, Walmart leather boots. Mm. And, you know, I, I don't think I was quite able to put myself out there enough that year. Cause you know, first year figuring it out, scared to death. Um, and so I think that that was a little bit different. If they'd been in the community run, I would think the competition would have been, completely different. The mm. third year was community led competition. So every single person who attended Northern Exposure could vote on who they wanted to be the state boot black. Um, so everyone got a ballot and they would come sit in the stands, they'd drop the ballot in whichever boot blacks it was competing, they won it. Okay. Um, it's me and another girl, Megan. And uh, all the um, people who volunteered, they had an extra vote. So if you volunteered at the event, you got an extra vote and you could vote on the fantasy portion. I think we're one of the few competitions that actually has a fantasy component, the Blacks. Which was terrifying for me because I am not a stand-up on stage person. Doing the speech was hard enough, but now I had to perform it at act. <laughs> Tell us about that. What did that entail for you? So for me, um, my partner at the time picked the song China Doll would, to be the background track for my piece and in that song are different things that we could use like piercing um beating and uh we use some bad dragon toys and luckily the people I had who participated in the fantasy with me were people I was very 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 comfortable with um my current husband was one of the people who participated he um pierced my chest like just jammed needled into my chest as part of the competition fantasy. Um, another friend flogged me with this really cool flogger that I liked. And then my, at that time, partner um, who 
had picked the music. He let me dress him up like a China doll with like makeup and a wig and a corset. <laughs> and we like messed with him with um, uh, Bad Dragon Dildo. And so I basically kind of subspaced out in, during that fantasy. So I don't remember it at all. <laughs> wow. I just was in the moment with the flogging and the needles and the wax and the things. And we didn't actually have any chance to rehearse it, which was really sad. Because so ours was completely just off the cuff. We do what we do. Wow. Um, the other person who competed, she did a really cool uh, not naughty dental hygienist scene. So there was toothpaste on everything that we were using too, because there was residual toothpaste left over because I went after her and she had practiced hers and practiced hers and hers was really, really good. But everything was very minty. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Too much mint. <laughs> And then, um, so the volunteers got to vote on that one. And then everyone got to vote on our tech boot. We each had to do a tech boot. Um, and our producer, she loves to mess up the tech boot. She gets them all kinds of dirty and she'll gr grind them against a brick wall. She'll just make you just want to cry when you see your tech boot. <laughs> Cause it's like, oh my God, it's so bad. Um, and so everyone got to vote on the tech boot, which was really cool. They would put their, no one knew whose tech boot was which. Just set them on table, have ballot boxes in front of them, you put your ballot in. And I won that year. I was completely shocked that I won. I uh, almost passed out on stage when they dropped the, the stole over my shoulders because I was just like, <gasps> and that was the best year. I had so much fun. I had such community support. It was great. I and find I interesting so that your fantasy huh? was not uh, boot blacking related. No, our fantasies could be anything we wanted. Oh, okay. And, um, and that's character. She's, we still do the fantasy component in our contests, even currently, because um, I was the third boot black. We've had two more contests and then COVID. And every year now, ever since our year, the fantasy component. And I love my producer. She's hilarious. She did not tell us that we had a fantasy component for our contest. Until after we had committed and turned in our applications and said, okay, we are running. Then she's like, okay, by the way, you have a fantasy. Because <laughs> she knew that I would like run scared. Mm. <laughs> so she's like, I'm not gonna tell you guys until the last minute. <laughs> so that was that's that's how she does things. <laughs> it's great. You said you had amazing fun and that it was a lot of community support. For example, tell me more about that. So our community, we don't expect our title holders to do any sort of fundraising for their year. Wow. Um, our producer guarantees that they will that a title winner will have three trips out of state. One of their choice, one of her choice, and one random. Okay. Where you kind of discuss it together and pick where you're gonna go. So you're guaranteed three trips. A lot of contests you have to fundraise to fund your trips so that you you know have the plane ticket money and you have the hotel money. She doesn't. She does not want us to fundraise at all. Incredible. So we're not, we're actually not even permitted to fundraise. Incredible. Um, if we are going for an international title, which the um, girl after me did, did run for international and Eric ran for international on his year, those we did fundraise for because you have to have the big gift baskets for international and all that kind of stuff. But for our trips, no fundraising. Um, we could do as little or as much in our year as we wanted. Um, she did expect us to contribute to the community, um, like be at socials and at least teach one class. Um, but we could do pretty much as little as we wanted. If we wanted to run for a competition after that, she would support us. She would do everything she could to make that happen. If we didn't, that's totally okay too. Um, so our, I did, um, the trip she picked was, um, Iowa leather weekend which was my first trip out of state as a boot black. I was um, super scared because I was going to an event that is geared mainly to men. Um, and here I am this, you know, kind of geeky girl <laughs> and I uh, was still kind of discovering myself. Um, and I'd just kind of fallen into the puppy universe at that point as well. And this is my first trip away from all my support. And, uh, I had a lot of boot black shifts at that. And my producer warned me, they may not like you. You're a girl. They may not come to your stand. You're a girl. And 
I did great. I had so much fun. I made so many friends. I participated in my first ever puppy mosh, which was amazing. And I was so scared. They, the puppies made me come and participate. <laughs> They like drag me out there. <laughs> it was great. And I'm the only girl and everyone's, you know, changing in the bar. And then they realized there was a girl in the room and they're like, oh, wait. And the person who was rooming with me had, we'd had a lot of conversations and I was just kind of figuring out that I was non-binary. And he was like, no, they're non-binary. It's fine. And then the guys were like, oh, okay. And kind of went right back to it. Like there wasn't a female in the room and it was great. And I watched them. Um, in the puppy mosh pit but i was too scared to interact so i was standing on the sidelines and this one puppy was like yeah i've been for five minutes if you don't like it you can get out and i went down there and everyone was super sweet to me and super kind to me and it was great <laughs> and i was partying and having fun with everybody and going everywhere my producer i don't think saw me more more than like two minutes the entire trip because i was gone. <laughs> <laughs> having fun with all the people and socializing and it was an amazing trip for the first trip out why did you not choose to go to a further title after yours um so i chose not to go for further title because i had too much going on in my personal life okay um the relationship the primary relationship that i was in when i started the title year ended during my title year in a very kind of dramatic way Mm -hmm. um we're still friends though and so I lost my home I lost my partner I lost my job I lost everything mm -hmm. and so I really could not foresee running for another title being feasible I needed to figure out my house I actually didn't take my third trip until the year after my title ended oh wow wow um I went to I actually went to Imsel um, as my second trip and my primary partner had left me three days before I was supposed to leave for that trip. Oh. So that was super rough. Um, my producer was kind of like, are you sure you really need to go on this trip? And I'm like, yeah, I need to go. I cannot be home. And she was concerned that I wasn't going to be able to separate my personal life situation and do what I needed to do as a title holder at a convention. Yeah. Um, and even my partner that had left me was like, no, let her go. She can separate it. She will enter title holder mode and personal life won't be even in her head. And that's pretty much what happened. Um, I, was at, I was in a polyamorous lifestyle at that time. So I had my secondary partner who is now my husband. Um, he's been supportive through everything. Whatever you want, you make it happen. You can do this. Um, but he was also, I'm not Captain save a ho so you need to figure it out for yourself. He wasn't going to rescue me. I didn't move in with him. Um, I actually got my very first apartment by myself. Wow. By myself. That was terrifying. I'd never lived alone in my entire life. I've always either been with parents or friends or a partner. Never lived by myself. So that was an interesting year. <laughs> a lot of things to learn. And went to Imsel, had a great time. I actually, when I arrived at Imsel, I had zero money in my pocket. I managed to uh, get a boot black shift and that shift made me able to do everything I needed to do in Insul and have a great time and have way too much money to spend. <laughs> wow. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Boop, that's one of the amazing things about boot blacking is if you are a boot black, no matter where you go, if it's a convention or an event, you can make money and be able to support yourself. You don't have to go there with tons of money in your pocket. You get a shift, you can make enough money to eat and, you know, have fun. Wow. And not be just like sitting on the sidelines broke. And that's one of the amazing things about being a boot black is it's a working title. Yeah. You got to do something. And then, yeah. Tell us about your, your puppy journey because you are a collared pup. Yes. I am. I am a collared pup. Um, I am actually kind of an odd pup because I'm a mixed pup. I'm um, actually a red panda. That's my primary side of my identity. But I'm also a bulldog. I'm my partner's bulldog. <laughs> but I'm real. I'm called panda, and it's not the black and white pandas. It's the really cute, fluffy red and gold pandas uh, that look like raccoons. Um, it's actually the type of panda I am. But uh, I uh, found puppyhood through uh, another community member who no longer lives here, and 
they kind of introduced me to the puppy thing during my um, journey to becoming a title holder. And I started kind of exploring it online because we really don't have a very large puppy community here mm. or puppy presence. There is a um, uh, pups and handlers group here, Alaska Pups and Handlers, of which I'm the president, even though nothing happens in it, even no matter how hard I try, <laughs> I try to get things going. Um, but Why we don't- Nobody's interested. Why isn't it happening? Um, that something happened in the community before I became the president that caused a bunch of the puppies to go underground. Uh, um, and so once you, once we're underground, it's kind of hard to like drag us out. Cause you gotta be, people gotta be brave enough to go to that first exposed social or whatever. Yeah. I mean, the puppies do show up at the convention. They do pop out at the convention, but we haven't really had any puppy moshes or anything like that. And then of course, right as I was starting to get things rolling, COVID happened on me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like, I started communicating with the puppies and talking to them. And I um, ended up taking over the AK pups and handlers when the previous president left the state. Um, and I have, uh, I have a couple of groups on social media that I'm a part of where I hang out with puppies and talk to other puppies. And whenever I travel out of state, I pop out because out of state, the puppies are out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's very much a way for me to shut off my brain. My brain's always going. I have a very active brain. And my current partner is not into uh, littles very much. And I'm also a little. So it's another way for me to have the same kind of um, disconnect from reality that I would get with the little space stuff with the puppyhood. Please explain littles. Okay, so littles are people who age regress, and there's there's a lot of different um, littles. So there's the age regressors who do it just as a type of therapy, not kink in any way, not sexual in any way, age regressors. They're in the more vanilla side. Then you have the kinky age players where there's dark age play, which is people who have sexual age play. Um, and then you have the non-sexual Littles, which I'm a non-sexual little, and uh, there's different age groups. So littles are usually anywhere from three to about twelve, it, where they age regress. Okay. Um, ABDLs, adult baby diaper levels, usually are the three and below. Got it. Um, middles are the the somewhere right between eleven and twelve, and you start getting into those teenage years, and then you have the teens. So there's all these different levels of littles. I fall between in the three to 11 age range, depending on my mood. Um, for me, it's a way to disconnect. And then the puppy is a lot like the little in the way things interact. Because of course, kids, littles love to be pets. I mean, how many children do we know has pretended to be a puppy dog when they were a kid? Yes. You know, or a kitten or whatever. So the age play and the, the pet play really go hand in hand um, for a lot of people. And... But the pup play allows me to be a little bit more sexual in that headspace than the little does. Um, so for me, pup play is a lot more sexual than my little play. My little play is absolutely no stuff, not sex. Okay. Um, I'm a little bit of a slutty puppy. Uh, <laughs> that's like very naughty. Um, but it, it's the same sort of disconnect and just not being aware of, you know, this bill is due or that bill is due, or I got to go do these dishes or you can just shut off. And I love being a puppy. I love having fun with pups. Pups are so much fun to play with. Um, they're also a very, very friendly group of people. Because mm -hmm. that puppy personality really tends to come out in a lot of pup players in their regular life. Like I have, don't think I've ever met a rude puppy. Hmm. I don't think I've ever met one who was not welcoming. Um, it's not, I mean, that may be just pure luck, but <laughs> I've always met amazing pups. Um, and like, they're very good about boundaries too. Cause like, if you're not wanting them to pump your leg or whatever, they'll back off. And even though a lot of people say pups will fuck shit up, they do. Cause they'll, you know, they have their squeakers in the dungeon and they squeaky toys and yeah. they're running around being puppies. So you have to kind of, some people have a hard time separating. Okay, I'm a puppy, but I'm in a dungeon. People don't want a squeaky toy going off every five seconds. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
but uh, so sometimes people have a little bit of aversion to puppies being in the dungeons, but our puppies are really good in the dungeon. They don't get in the hand. They they will squeak a squeaker every once in a while, but most of us are pretty well mannered pups. <laughs> I'm a very well mannered pup because my my handler would be very mad at me if I wasn't. <laughs> so is is your uh, puppy named Panda, or what yes. puppy name do you assume? My my name Panda goes through every aspect. I it's a name I use in real life. I don't actually use my legal name anywhere except in legal situations. Got it. Um, simply because everyone knows me as Panda. I've had people use my real name and I'm like, are you talking to me? <laughs> Cause I don't ever use it. Wow. Um, but yeah, I'm a puppy that's named Panda. I'm a Panda that's named Panda and I'm me that's named Panda. It's all Panda. <laughs> what advice can you offer someone looking to get into looking to get into boot blacking puppy play or the littles what can you say to someone watching this who may want to do that um so it's there's one universal piece of advice that pretty much goes for all three of them is figure out a way to find your local community whether that's you go online and go on to god forbid vet life um that life is such a set full now <laughs> um Go on FetLife, find the local munch listings on there. Because pretty much every community will have munches listed on FetLife. If it is pretty much the main way to get the word out there. Um, find someone in your local area who's that you feel comfortable with and have them help you find your way. Um, but be careful. Don't just, you know, meet some random person off of FetLife or Facebook or wherever without making sure they're a safe person, vet who you're going to meet with. But it's hard when you're new, you don't know anybody to use to vet people. But there are ways. You can see how they interact with people online. You can see what their social media says, stuff like that. Always get people's real names before you meet them. <laughs> Have a safe call. But um, find your local community, whatever that is, whether it's through meetups, vet life. There's so many ways to find your local community online. And then go to a munch. Munches are scary because, you know, you're meeting a bunch of people in person for the first time. They don't know you. You don't know them. Just bite the bullet. Be brave. They're not going to bite unless you like that and you ask for it. You know, the munches are there for people to meet. So the people that are there are going to be open and friendly because that's what the munches are for is to meet people. Yes. Um, and they're generally munches are in very safe places. They're in the back room of Denny's. They're at the local coffee shop. Um, they're at the coffee shop in Starbucks. You know, like they're usually very public spaces. Mm. And if you need to go the first time and maybe not interact, just watch from another table and see if that group feels comfortable to you. Mm. Step in there, introduce yourself to someone in the group. And then it's all over from there because you're going to fall down the rabbit hole real quick and get to know people but that is the key you just have to do it just have to do it and that's a hard thing for this introverted shy people like me was getting out there and doing it um my first jump into the real world community was actually here in alaska with the northern exposure convention we got tickets to northern exposure went to northern exposure and it was over from there you couldn't get me out of it <laughs> Because at the time, I lived in a really little tiny town that did not have any kink community. It's a town of, you know, during the winter and the off season, not first season, maybe 1,500 people. Okay. First season, it booms to about 20. But uh, yeah, so you had to come to Anchorage to get any community. And it was a two-hour drive. So the oh, first boy. interaction was Northern Exposure. How did and you learn about that? Bet life. I, I was looking for community. I was looking for connections. I found Discover Fet Life, and I found a um, uh, an event listing for Northern Exposure, and it looked really, really cool. And my husband, my partner at the time, and I said, "Okay, let's go do it. Let's, let's get tickets. Let's go." And that was the first time he and I kind of branched out in our poly. Um, 
because I wanted to do some things that he really wasn't into, but I was very much into. Um, he's, he's more of a gentle dom. He's more of a littles dom. Um, I'm much more of an edgy player. I, the gentle stuff, I'm like, okay, I'm bored. Um, <laughs> give him something, something hardcore. Um, and so my first uh, things I did, I did a cutting with Phoenix V. And that's how I met my uh, current partner is he did a corset piercing on my back. Oh, and nice. I stalked him for three years after that until I got him. <laughs> but that was I'm my... I did. <laughs> I did. I am too. It's the best thing I ever did. Um, but that was my introduction. And that's, you know, the, this community had never seen me before. Didn't know who I was. And here I am coming in hard with cuttings and pierce, corset piercings. And they're like, okay. <laughs> you know? Wow. And so it, it's really, this community is really great. We're very welcoming of newbies. And we're all about education up here. We want people to play safe. Yeah. Um, you know, as safe as you can be with King. You know. <laughs> Safe-ish. Safe adjacent. <laughs> now, what are your thoughts on mentoring in all three of these cases? Oh, mentoring is an amazing thing if you can find the right combination of people. Um, and... I firmly believe that mentors should not be someone's partner that they're, you know, in a sexual or romantic relationship with mentor should be, this is an educational relationship or a growth relationship. Okay. Um, particularly for newbies, it really should be separated. Um, in my opinion, my personal opinion, which may mean nothing, but because when you mix relationship and sex in there, things get a little complicated. You get a whole different ball game. But always seek out mentors. There's mentors in everything. We have great community leaders and mentors here for rope and for um, blood play and for um, flogging and for wax play. We have really strong leaders with wax play here and cupping, um, fire cupping, which is really cool. Hey, fire. <laughs> um, so find, figure out what you like. Find someone to teach you how to do that. Learn it from both sides. Don't just, oh, I'm a sub. I only need to know how to take it. No, you need to learn how to give it to. Because mm -hmm. in that way, if you decide to go to a event out of state and go play with some random person, you can know if they're doing something completely incorrect, it's going to hurt you. Yes. Learn it from both sides. Get a sub mentor, get a top mentor. Experience it from both sides. And I think that's true for both tops and bottoms. Tops should learn how to take it as much as they can give it because yes. and they know how that feels to the bottom and you know mentoring mentorship is extremely critical to growth in the king community and we need more mentors and we need more people who are willing to be mentors we don't think just because you're a bottom that you can't be a mentor correct but it's critical that there's mentors out there and everyone can mentor in some way whether it's making someone more comfortable with talking to other people mentorship doesn't have to be just kink it can be how to navigate social interactions. Cause I know, you know, some people don't have the greatest social skills. Maybe they need someone to help them learn how to navigate that. So then they can learn how to navigate kink environment. Yes, I agree. Is key. Yeah. Mentorship is key. We have some great mentors out there, both locally and internationally. I've met some amazing international mentors. What's the biggest misconception about you? Um, Not sure. Uh, I think some people underestimate what I'm able and willing to do. Um, I think some people think that I am, you know, just this girl that latches on to some hate person and then I take over or that I top from the bottom. I don't. I have very um, balanced relationships. Um, there was some misconceptions that came about during the breakup of the last relationship um, with some community members and me. They felt it was my fault and that I was the problem in the relationship. Um, and I think it was kind of a balance of both of us. Both of us had gotten to a point where we weren't beneficial. But I'm a lot stronger than people think. And I'm a lot more willing to be there for people than people think. 
because I'm in this quiet, shy person in the corner. And so some people think that I'm standoffish, maybe. I'm not. Come to me. I'm a firm believer. I follow like, you know, um, people like Tibbers, who is, you can come to me if you're feeling bullied, if you're feeling attacked, if you're feeling left out or excluded. I am there for you. I will back you up. I'm part of No Pups Left Behind. We don't leave anyone behind. We are here for everybody. And I am a safe place. No matter what, I will believe you if, you, if you're a victim. I will back you up. I will find out the facts. And I will defend you. And I'm always there for my community. Whatever my community needs, I will find a way to help. In whatever way I can. I may not be able to help financially for some things, but I'll be there to, you know, clean the kitchen after you're done cooking or serve the food or whatever needs to be done. I, that's what we do. A lot stronger than I look. <laughs> well, Panda Pup and Boots, thank you for an amazing interview from Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm glad I was able to be a part of it. <laughs>